perfect. All right, council member, we are live. Great, thank you very much. Um, I would like to call to order the January 10th, 2022 meeting of the City of Charleston Traffic and Transportation Committee. Thank you all for joining in. And as we begin with a moment of silence, please. Amen and thank you. I think this might be the first committee meeting of the new year. Am I right about that? The first official committee meeting of the city of Charleston for 2022. So thank you all for joining in. We'll make it um, momentous, I hope. Um, first item on the agenda is approval of minutes from September 27th. Do I have a motion? I'll move I'll for move. approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion, additions, deletions, corrections? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Next on our agenda is an update on the Ashley River Pedestrian Bridge. Mr. Kronsberg and team. I see Mr. Kronsberg is on the line. So Good afternoon. Um, hand it over to you. Mr. Chairman, committee members, uh, happy new year. Um, been lots of things going on behind the scenes over the, the past quarter of, of the last year. Um, we've got Michael Darby, who is our project manager with HDR here. Um, Edmund Moss is here as well. So really what we want to do today is um, have Michael present to you all uh, pretty much a verbal update of uh, the last quarter of 2021 and uh, what we have been doing over the past couple of months and where we are going with the project in the future. So that's just a really brief introduction and I'm gonna turn the floor over to Michael and please let us know if you have any questions along the way because um, there's a couple months of work that we'll be kind of discussing. What I would suggest to the members of the committee, if that's okay, let's get our presentation um, and then sort of reserve questions till the end, if that suits everybody okay? Great, well, uh, Mr. Darby, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, thank you all and thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, so I was going to, like Jason mentioned, I'm just going to walk you all through kind of what the happening since September of uh, 2021 up to today and then then kind of carry it forward and kind of give you an update of what's going to happen over the next uh, few months and into uh, into the end of the year. So um, in September, um, we received a sign categorical exclusion for the project through FHWA. Um, that was a you know, significant milestone for approval of the of the um, NEPA documentation on the project. Um, at that time, um, city advertised a request for qualifications for design build teams um, that was advertised in September. And we also submitted 30% design plans to the SCDOT structures for their review. Um, in October, we received um, two statement of qualifications from design build teams. It was a little uh, disappointing. We we're uh, hoping to get uh, three to five submittals on it. So, it was, you know, only getting two was, was uh, not, not the greatest news. Um, in November, the team met for, uh, to, to shortlist the design build teams and did shortlist the two, the two teams that, um, that, that submitted qualifications packages. Um, coming out of that meeting, you know, just with only getting two, we, we had some conversations with, um, with some contractors who we were expecting to propose and uh, just try to find out why they didn't. Um, and kind of the consensus from, from the three contractors we spoke with was all that they, they all thought the project was more in the $40 million range. Um, and the city's current funding on the project is 26.25 million. So about a $14 million uh, difference between, uh, between the, the, the funding versus the uh, belief of the, of what the project cost may be. So at that point in time, we uh, HDR um, kind of reevaluated the project costs using a risk-based approach. I um, mean, basically take the the base project cost estimate, um, take that out to a year of expenditure, and then apply um, apply a bunch of project risk to to the uh, cost. Um, and what we found is, yeah, you know, that that estimate came in in the thirty-five to forty-three million dollar range. 
with about a $41 million um, expected overall uh, project program costs. The biggest issue on the for the costs that we found was the, the cost escalation due to the current market conditions that are out there. Um, it's just a you know cra- crazy time right now with COVID and supply chain issues, and um, that that really really impacted the cost. So coming out of that um, that evaluation, we, we kind of looked at you know what we can do to to maybe reduce the scope of the project while still meeting the um, kind of the the purpose of the project, which is really to provide a, a safe bike and ped crossing across the Asher River. So we've gone back in and looked at reducing the width of the bridge from uh, the, the current, the, the previous design was 20 feet wide, reducing it down to 14 feet wide, um, and reduced the, the path width along the, um, along the causeway to uh, 10 feet from 12 feet. Um, and then something else we're looking at instead of the concrete kind of wishbone tower that y'all previously saw in the in the renderings um using two two steel towers on on each side of the bridge with cables going down to to support it um those were kind of the the main areas to to kind of help with the with the cost savings in december so we moved into kind of looking at that design doing some detailed modeling on the structure with you know being 14 feet wide um, redoing our cost estimate um, by, by reducing the width of the structure um, and, and looking, looking at some more details on some seismic, um, seismic design requirements, um, showing about a savings about $9 million. So bringing the, bringing the cost down into a range of 28 to 30, $32.8 million. Um, and yeah, the project cost difference there compared to available funding um, anywhere from 1.75 to 6.55 million dollars. Um, what was that number again? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you give us that projected number again? The uh, 28 to 32.8 million. Um, and one number I'll report is this: there's a 70th percentile number. That's kind of an FHWA accepted um, kind of standard number that they use. You know, you'll give a range, but then say. That, but at that 70th percentile is a uh, 31.6 million. And that's kind of their kind of approved number for, for what a project cost would be, but they really like that range. And then the, then the, the, the 70th percentile number. Also in December, we submitted the uh, U S army Corps permit. Um, Assuming all goes well with that, it's a, we should receive approval for that next month. Um, and then at that time, we can submit the uh, Coast Guard permit for, for their review and approval. Um, starting off this month, we've been uh, coordinating with SCDOT and FHWA on the seismic design requirements for the project. Um, SCDOT's standard for seismic is a 2,500 year event. Um, we've been looking into what a thousand year seismic event um, and trying to get approval from them on that one. And sounds like we're, we're, we've, we're going to get approval from them. They had a few questions for us on the, on the reasoning behind it. And, um, one thing to note is, you know, we're seeing a savings of anywhere from two and a half to $3 million on the structure by using the going with the thousand year event versus that 2,500 year. Um, also this month, we'll be looking at updating the 30% plans on this new base design, the 14 foot wide structure, um, and then submitting our uh, OCRM permits um, for, for their review. Um, and that, that that's a little bit tougher timeline. They don't have like, like the core permit where I've said February, we know that they've got a, a timeline that, that they go through their approvals, the OCRMs in this, isn't as well defined, so I hadn't put a, a an assumed approval date on that permit. Um, moving into February, we'll be working on the draft RFP request for request for proposals for the project, and getting those to um, to the city, DOT, and FHWA for review. March and April, review and update draft RFP, and get that um, get that in the hands of the design build teams in April. Um, for their for their review and um, so from May to July design build teams will be reviewing the RFP providing questions meeting with the city uh, really ramping up their their efforts on the on the project 
Um, and we'll be making re revisions to the RFP based on their questions and, and comments on it. August, um, this is a key, key milestone, is getting the RFP, the final RFP issued to the design build teams. And that, that at that point in time, um, hits the federal requirement for obligating the project for construction, um, which the, the federal obligation date for this one is September 30th um, to meet the, the federal uh, fiscal year requirement. So getting that in August would be, would be perfect. It still gives a little bit of flow time in there in case there's some, some things that come up uh, between now and then. Third and fourth quarters of this year, received technical cost proposals from design build teams, um, construction contract approval by the city council. And then first quarter of 2023, issue notice proceed to the design builders, to the design build team. And then basically all of 2023 um, would be design efforts by the design build team. Um, possible construction of some of the intersection improvements if they could, yeah. You know, there's no reason why some of those intersections, the Wapu Road, um, Folly Road, even even down at um, at Lockwood, could potentially move those move those designs forward through through design and permitting. Go ahead and kick off construction on those and show a little progress. And then, really, all of 2024 and 2025, we would anticipate the bridge being under construction. So about a one and a half to two year duration on the on the construction of the bridge. And that's it, and then we'll open it. Great, all right. <laughs> uh, Jason, anything to add on top of that? Or Mr. Most, I see you there too. No, it was a lot of information that he covered. Just, just so everybody knows that once we issue the RFP, the two shortlisted teams will be conducting a considerable amount of work to further along the design in order to get to a bid number for their um, response to that RFP. So you know, in this design build process, we're providing them with a 30% drawing set. So it's a lot of work on their part once they get that information and we'll be working with them daily to answer questions as, the, as we move it forward. Edmund, anything from you? No, I don't have anything else to add. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for any member of the committee? I also note that Council Member Shade and Council Member Pell are also on the line. And seeing as this is a rare opportunity after we go through the committee, I saw the mayor's now on the line too, right? Um, we'll allow Council Member Shade and Appell to ask a question or two if they have any. So um, to start off, I see Council Member Jackson with her hand up. The floor is yours. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman. And thanks for everybody being on. And all the work that y'all are just, you know, it's amazing uh, to think about the speed that you have to um, make adjustments. So I just wanted to clarify in terms of the pricing, um, the, 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 the downward adjustment is based on the steel cables, the steel towers. And um, does it also reflect then your hope that you'll get the 1000 year seismic <clears throat> permit? So we won't see any savings once you know the answer to that then. That's right. The 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 cost reflects that that savings already. And in terms of um, what you've done in order to, you know, drop down the overall cost projection, is, is there any like hiccups to the approvals that you got from the federal government ahead of time or anybody else that's going to be looking at the change in materials or you know, overall instruction design? Are, are we past those hurdles? We should be past those hurdles. There may be, and this being design build, it's a little different approach because the design build teams may come up with a design that that is completely different than what we're, what we've come up with. So, um, you know, if they have something that, that is, is completely different from what was uh, what was permitted through the um, through FHWA originally in that categorical exclusion. Um, they may have to go back for a for a reevaluation of that, but it's usually if that happens, it's a relatively minor um, piece of the puzzle. It wouldn't impact schedule so much. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for all the amazing work. Great. Thanks. 
Uh, Councilmember Brady, any questions? No, I'm good. Thanks. Great. Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Michael, and uh, all our staff who've been working so diligently on this and keeping it on schedule, despite the fact of, um, <clears throat> as they've advised you, um, the uh, challenges of of, of costs and, and what's going on in the construction world today. So um, admittedly, uh, we may end up with a, with a project that's not as wide as a, a path that's not quite as wide, but it's still w w way beyond what, for example, uh, is over the Ravenel Bridge. It will be safe. Um, it will be um, a great addition to our city. I'm glad we're able to keep keep it on track and keep it going to, despite um, the cost considerations. Um, so I just want to thank everybody's work on helping us do that. Um, I, I do plan just to, to let y'all know um, to to meet with a uh, presuming that mayor's conference meeting to, is still on next week up in Washington. I plan to meet with uh, folks up in Washington to, to see about augmenting our budget a little bit on it. And, uh, you know, you don't get kissed. I don't, I never have, I, I get kissed unless I ask. So I'm, I am going to be asking federal highways, uh, to help supplement the budget, but, but, um, regardless, we're going to keep on pushing on. Great. Thank you. Um, council member shade, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Certainly. so sort of a, a throw out question to where we can respond to this. Um, what does it really mean when you're reducing or proposing to reduce this width from 20 feet to 14 feet? What does that really do to this, this overall bridge? Well, it makes it cheaper. Uh, I got that part. It makes it narrower and it makes it cheaper. I, that there you go. I can answer my own question. But in, 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 the, in the great scheme of things, um, what, did, what is that really doing to this? This is going to be a... I've certainly, for, in, in our generation, once in a lifetime generational uh, structure coming across that we've been dealing with for at least, I guess, 20 something, 20 years, give or take. Um, so when you are reducing something from from here to here, what, what does that really do? What, what, what kind of impact does that really have um, on, on this um, on this structure? I mean, well, are, are, you, are, you, are you reducing the, the ability uh, it's sort of like a, a, an ongoing running question of sorts. Um, you're designing something to carry a load. And if this was something that you were carrying vehicles across, you would say, well, we need to have X uh, dimensions to handle X number of vehicles at a certain hour. I mean, that, that's how these engineers sort of figure this stuff out, I think. So when you're talking about reducing from 20 feet to 14 feet, what does that do for the capacity of getting folks across? Because this is certainly a non-vehicle uh, uh, passageway, but you've got people who are running, walking on bicycles, pushing strollers. What impact is that going to have on those folks? Are you going to have one lane in and one lane out? What is this going to impact? Well, if I may uh, give a preliminary uh, response and say functionally it's the same. We'll be able to safely get bicyclists and pedestrians in two directions back and forth across the river. So functionally it's the same. Um, yeah, if you were to have like a 5k event, you wouldn't be able to get as many people on the bridge at one time, um, you know, and it won't be quite as spacious as it could would have been otherwise, but Functionally, in terms of safely getting people back and forth, it, it, it does the same job. Am I missing anything, Michael? I don't think so. And I, I mean, 14 feet wide is going to be comfortable. Um, it's not, you know, the Ravenel, like you mentioned, Mayor, it was, it's 12 feet wide and that, that gets tight on there. Um, you don't, we looked at it, we didn't want to go any, any narrower than 14. Um, that's kind of the minimum you want. Um, it provides two, two feet of, of distance off the rail for for bicyclists, um, which is a kind of the standard. You, you assume they need two feet of of distance off of a off of a rail to to ride comfortably. Um, so having that, you know, overall fourteen is is a is a good a good width. 
and, and, and the reason, Mr. Chairman, I'm asking that question is because, um, and, and the Ravenel Bridge is a, is a good uh, mindset. Everybody who's been on the Ravenel Bridge knows what that entails. Um, but the Ravenel Bridge, and as I understand it, and in the times I've used it, is more of a recreational type uh, bridge. This this bridge is going to be a uh, a facility to move folks from point A to point B, um, and I think that perhaps because of the height of the bridge, the short distance of the bridge, its location, you will see a heavier traffic. And, I, and I'm just asking. I'm not I'm not trying to dissuade y'all from doing anything else. But I thought it was just that's why I wanted to jump in on this call. To ask those kind of questions. Um, I think you can see more of a, of a volume uh, on this, a different volume um, than you will on the Robert L. Bridge. But that's, those are my questions, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the response I got from the mayor and from Michael. Thank you. Well, clearly it's a shorter and flatter span than the Ravenel, so you think naturally there would be more people using it for commute rather than recreation. But it seems to me that 14 feet although not as good as 20, is functionally doable and will provide access for just about anybody, right? Does it provide access, enough access for handicap um, use? Yeah, I would, I would believe so, yes. Okay, great. Um, Council Member Pell, I see you there patiently. Any questions while you're here? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the update from everybody, uh, Jason, Michael, Edmund, everybody. And, um, you know, as the council member whose district this bridge will emanate from out of West Ashley into downtown, I mean, I'm just couldn't be more excited about this project um, and, and, you know, want to be a part of a solution to help keeping this on track and making it succeed. So not here to get into anybody's way or interfere with anything, just want to show my support. And if I can help mm -hmm. further, please let me know. And Let's all just work together as a team and keep plugging this along. I, you know, anytime you're trying to build infrastructure of any kind of significance in America these days, you're going to have challenges. So the challenges are, are inevitable. It's how we respond to those challenges that are going to ultimately dictate whether this uh, happens or not. So I, I think we're doing that. Um, and I want us to keep pushing as hard as we can on all fronts. And I'm very encouraged by what the mayor said and, you know, they're giving, a lot of, giving out a lot of money out of Washington these days. And if we could get in there and, and get some additional support, uh, this, um, this project checks a whole lot of boxes. And um, I've still got Keith Benjamin's um, cell phone number. Uh, we might, might be able to put in a call to him as well. I think he's working up on, up on the hill these days. So let's keep working as a team and make this happen. It's a very exciting project. Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Seeing as I'm certain that this will come up when we report this out tomorrow night at City Council, um, do you all team have any preliminary thoughts about how we make up the delta between monies that we know are available and monies that we're going to need to complete this project at the level 28 to 32 million dollars that you predicted in this meeting? Well, well the reduced scope um, brings that delta down. And we don't know what the final number will be, but uh, once again, I, I, I do plan to ask um, um, the grant maker, um, Federal Highways, to, to I'm going to make them aware of our situation and ask them to, to for some more. Um, it thankfully is also in a, um, a TIF district, um, the Horizon TIF district, which I know has been dedicated mostly to uh, West Edge development, but at some point, if it need be, um, it could be a source for, for um, to make up. Uh, am I right, Mr. Mayor, if 32 million plus or minus turns out to be about right, is that Delta, what, eight, nine million between what we've got committed and we know about in 32? We've already put an extra three towards it and um, and so I think the Delta would be about six from where we are right okay. now, right? Yeah. 18, two and three. Okay. All right. Well, um, any other questions from any other member of the committee? Um, thank you for taking time out to give us this update. As you all are well aware, this is a project that um, people are very interested in seeing completed and love getting these updates. So I know you all have a lot to do. So getting the update really is helpful for us. 
particularly those of us who live on either side of the river uh, where the bridge will um, start, finish, finish, start. Um, there's lots of questions about it. So um, thank you very much. And uh, we'll probably ask you to come back again in the spring, um, unless anything dramatic happens in the interim. We'd hope you certainly will report back to us. I know the mayor is keeping a close eye on it. So that's all, uh, it's all great. So thank you very much, unless there's anything else. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next item on the agenda. Anything else from anybody else in the committee? Thanks for letting me chime in, Mr. Chairman. I'm log off. We're happy to have you. Thank you very much. And Council Member Pell as well. Thank you. All Thank right. You. Next on next on the agenda, I guess, is something I put on there, the discussion of the parklets and the on-street dining. Um, very briefly, uh, this committee will remember during the course of COVID as a result of the efforts of Council Member Brady, the Bike Ped Committee, and some others, there were some recommendations that came through TNT for improving access to the outdoors and for businesses to have some opportunity to succeed in an era where it was very difficult to serve food uh, and drink inside. And one of those recommendations that we came up with and, and ran through to city council, which was adopted unanimously, as I recall, and somewhat popular, was the idea that there may be some opportunities in the streets of Charleston to do parklets. Uh, and I, I think I'm right about this, that uh, there are two businesses that availed themselves of the opportunity, um, Baba's and Cuddy's. And they're distinct, they're distinct in their projects in one regard, and that is one, and please, Robbie, correct me if I'm wrong, one was constructed on a street that is controlled and owned by the city, and one was constructed on a street that is not, um, that being the Baba's. So one of the questions that I have, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Somerville, is I, I got a copy of the map that shows sort of the, the checkerboard of streets on the peninsula and who owns what. And I was actually first somewhat surprised how many streets that the city owns slash controls, um, a good number of them, one of which is the block just to the west of where Baba sits on Calhoun Street. Um, and, and as we think about going forward, because I do, I'm looking at the resolution that and the ordinance that we put forward at city council. One of the things when it came to parklets was to make sure that we had some opportunity to think about making the parklet program more permanent. Um, and that's, I think, impossible to do unless the parklets are on city streets. My question is, uh, and doesn't have to be answered now, but looking forward as we think about these projects and Bob is being a perfect example, what does it actually cost us when we take back a city street for maintenance purposes? Um, do we keep a running tally of that as to the expense of maintaining streets that the city controls as opposed to streets the state or county would maintain? So we do not keep track of that that I'm aware of. And uh, I know that the DOT has figures on that, Mr. Chairman, because a few years ago when they um, proposed a pilot program, which, which they've never uh, come back to us on. They, they um, proposed that the city take um, DOT streets and they would give us a 40 year maintenance budget. So they, they have some numbers that they cooked up that, that um, you know, was a part of that offer. We actually, um, just to try the program out, listed a few, streets we were willing to um, um, accept in the program, but they, they never uh, followed up to um, quote, give them to us or the money. So uh, that hasn't happened yet. So there, I, Robbie, do you know what that is? Is something, you know, standard dollar per foot or per year, so many dollars. But anyway, we can get those figures. They do, they do have uh, some analysis on that. Thanks. I, I just think, Mr. Mayor, if, if we're going to, you know, I mean, the idea was as this, as this program sort of came into its sunset, that we would be in the sunset of COVID. Maybe that was a little bit of wishful thinking. Uh, hopefully we're closer to sunset than sunrise. But it seems to me that it's been popular and has worked. And as we look into the future and maybe thinking about opportunities for doing this some more, um, having an understanding of what actually the cost of, of taking back a portion of a city street might be because it's clear to me and I, I think that everyone would concur that unless we control the street a, a parklet is not a long-term solution from the DOT's perspective they're just not going to let us do it um, and I, I'm just looking at the map now I mean I don't know like like we own almost the entire straight um, length of Cumberland Street we own a 
good bit of King Street. Um, we own, like I said, the block just to the west of where Baba's is on Calhoun. And I just didn't know if we, if we internally think that that's a huge maintenance burden on us, whether it's a big deal at all or not, as we think about ways to move this program forward and make it more permanent. Certainly be good to know that we're not putting ourselves in financial jeopardy and maybe actually creating some opportunities for revenue. So I just, I just think that that may be a worthwhile exercise if it doesn't take too much time and energy on the part of Mr. Somerville and his team. Well, we can we can certainly find out. That, like I said, they had those formulas figured out. Um, but if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, I would just like to share my thoughts with you and the other committee members about this topic briefly. Sure, um, please. So. Personally, I, I kind of like the notion of parklets, um, but um, on DOT streets, uh, they have made it infinitely clear to us at this time that um, that was an emergency uh, matter and uh, they, they will not allow uh, parklets on their streets, which, uh, you know, I respect their, their uh, position on that. Um, so that leads you to think, well, could we do it on city streets? And, and I have asked the zone uh, planning department to come up with a set of guidelines uh, by which we would consider a parklet on a city street, which uh, in my opinion would have to include a fee, uh, number one, and number two would have to uh, include support of the nearby property owners and uh, neighborhood you know, before as part of those requirements, if you will, for 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 putting one in, in place. Um, that that all being said, um, I think they'll proceed and, and do so. So in the meantime, both the one that was on a DOT street and and the other which was on the city street, I we've asked both of them to remove them at this time. Uh, uh, and the one that's on the city street will be able to come back after we develop some guidelines and apply. And, um, you know, we could consider that. Personally, I got to tell you, I, I mean, I don't have that number for maintenance on the top of my head. We'll get it for you. But it, it's hard for me to um, um, justify unless um, a property owner was willing to pay a fee high enough to cover, you know, the, the whole block or whatever um, section we ask to come into the city system, um, I, I think that would be a, a pretty high number. But anyway, we can, we can work the numbers on that. I, I have a hard time justifying um, bringing a city into the city uh, uh, responsibility from the DOT um, just for this purpose alone. Uh, if there is not a more compelling public purpose as there was when we took Murray Boulevard, for example, in order to complete the, um, the low battery seawall project. Now that, that was a real public purpose and was worth us taking the road uh, back from the DOT just in order to accomplish that. But, um, you know, unless we had some other public purpose or compelling reason, um, to me, it it, it, kind of, it it seems hard to justify taking a DOT street in order to accommodate a parklet. So, but but that's just my gut gut reaction on the whole thing and, and kind of where we stand right now. Well, thank you. I, I I suspect if we put some metrics to this, Mr. Mayor, that the actual cost on some of these streets is de minimis at best. But we can find that out. I think as we sort of look at it. I mean, I'm looking at the map now. Uh, I happen to used to live on a street that was city owned and controlled, and I don't recall there ever being any maintenance on it ever in the 25 years to live there. So, but I mean, the things like paving and stuff, the county and the state will still do it. Anyway, um, I didn't want to take up a whole bunch of time on this, but if we can sort of get a sense of what it really means in terms of actual dollars to do that, because there's a number of streets that we've taken back for a bunch of different purposes, some of which clearly are commercial, is to allow some developments and things like that. So let's uh, at yeah. least get a handle on it so as we go forward and think about this. And I know that Mr. Summerfield is well aware, but during the course of COVID, the Civic Design Center did a, a good bit of work on sort of standard design features for parklets and the like. So probably don't need to reinvent the wheel, just get with um, Morgan and that team over there. They've got some pretty good thoughts on it already. Um, that I think are 
attractive, safe, and um, would stand as a good standard as we look for some opportunities in the future. Anything else on this subject from any other matter of the committee, member of the committee? Okay, hearing none. Next, um, discussion on non-consensual tow ordinance. Ms. Halverson, who I just see has come to life on our screen. Yes, ma'am. Afternoon, everyone. How are you? Good. Great. How are you doing? Um, okay, so the city has been notified of some recent predatory towing practices that are occurring where the towing company and the private property owners are towing vehicles even when the vehicle owner shows up maybe just a minute late or um, maybe they've parked incorrectly and they come back to change it um, or after just a very short period of time. And obviously this is very expensive for our citizens and our visitors and, and causes a lot of, you know, um, issues with having to get their vehicles back and paying to get them out of towing and everything like that. So the legal department has been tasked with um, researching some options that we might have uh, to address this problem. And Mallory Shear in our office has done some great research on other municipal towing ordinances um, and she found that recently the city of North Myrtle Beach actually addressed this exact problem. And the way that they amended their ordinance was to require the presence of a police officer on site before the towing company could take the vehicle away. Um, and the police officer would actually have to give a signature on a form and be present while it happened to legitimize the towing process. Um, and we thought that this was a good uh, resolution that would you know, help legitimize the process here in the city of Charleston. Uh, the mayor actually suggested that we have a parking enforcement officer be present, maybe rather than a police officer. And we thought that was a good idea just for staffing purposes. It won't tie up the police department as much. Um, but during off hours when our parking enforcement officers may not be available, then the police department could act as backup in that way. Um, and so, you know, as long as we have an officer, whether it's a parking enforcement officer or a police officer present, then you know, they can actually, you know, give a little bit more weight to, um, you know, checking out the situation. If the vehicle owner runs up at the last minute, you know, they might have an opportunity to talk to the police officer or the parking enforcement officer and work it out before you know it becomes a fully towed vehicle right at the last minute. So that was our idea for some changes. Um, I'll open it up for discussion for everybody now, but if you like this direction, we can certainly draft an amended ordinance to at our next meeting. Any questions of Ms. Talverson? Was there any specific incident that gave rise to this? I, I don't know about you, but I, I get letters and um, on on a regular basis, mostly from visitors, but sometimes from you know citizens that uh, or, or regional citizens, you know, who have been on a, a downtown private lot and um, come back like five minutes after their um, duly paid. Um, you know, permission to be on the lot and, and their car is being towed away and they're like, in, they're in total shock, disbelief. And then they start the process of finding where their car went, um, you know, the fees, the storage, the time, the, I mean, for, and I would five minutes late getting back to my car, you know, it, it just, it seems absurd really. And, and what I've come to find out on some occasions that the, the the property owner doesn't even collect any of the towing fees. He just wants to get his, his parking revenue. And so he basically gives the towing company carte blanche. You, you just do whatever you want. You know, I want them off my lot if, they, if, they, if they're not exactly current. And, and so um, I, 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 I've heard stories about what, I, what sounds like unscrupulous uh, tow truck uh, drivers who who hold people up or, or you know um, you know give them a hard time and, and are rude and um, 
Oh, I get I get a number of stories along these lines. I don't know about y'all. I have to agree with the mayor that you know that's the uh, the complaints that I get are you know people just a minute late. They didn't uh, realize that the lot was private. Um, and, and next thing they know, they're paying two hundred five dollars to uh, retrieve their vehicle for being towed. Um, so that that is a constant complaint that I receive. As well. It seems to me, Mr. Mayor and Robbie, there's two different categories that we're talking about here. The one which people pay to be on private lot and come back a few minutes late and they're towed. That's one. And those are people who have business licenses with the city um, in order to operate a commercial enterprise. And then there's the purely private lot scenario where someone just parks at a private lot. They haven't paid any money or anything and someone wants them towed. And it would seem to me that a situation is dealt with better through the business licensing process than it is through an ordinance that would require either a police officer or a PEO in any one of the 200 square miles of the city if there's gonna be a private tow. I just think those are two separate and distinct situations. Anyway, that's my two cents on this. I mean, you know, if, if on the business license side, Mr. Mayor, if someone's operating a commercial enterprise parking privately, I mean, we could build into the business licensing requirements that, you know, if someone's overtime, they can't be towed for some number of minutes or whatever, rather than just immediately. But what, what do we do with the situation where someone's out in Shadow Moss or Village Green and they're parked on a private lot and they got to wait for a PO or a police officer to come? I, I just think we're creating a pretty big bureaucratic um, scenario by which um, we're, no one's going to be happy. I mean, how, how many POs do we have, Robbie? Um, we're budgeted for 34 um, in our parking enforcement um, office, but we currently have 24 on staff. And how many are deployed on the peninsula as opposed to off? Uh, majority is on the peninsula, I would say. Um, Sorry, I was getting a call. Um, I would say probably 12 are on the peninsula. Thanks. Any other questions, Council Member Jackson? Thank you. Um, I think you pose an interesting um, alternate solution, Chairman. But frankly, the first thought that I had as you were talking was how the heck are we going to enforce the business license and what would it mean they'd have to accumulate, you know, a certain uh, track record of of um, non-consensual tow, that, that to me seems like a, a bureaucratic, um, you know, sort of subjective process that I think would be very hard to continue over time. Um, and I, I really didn't get the impression from uh, Ms. Sterling, I mean, Ms. Halverson, that we were talking about purely private lots um, that people just happen on. I mean, then the owner has to call the tow truck and basically that that's a whole different scenario. I, I thought the whole anecdotal history of this sounded like people that were paying in good faith. And yes, um, they knew that they had a certain amount of time to be there or whatever. And, and, and that time ran out on them or they violated some other condition of their, of their, of their contract essentially with the, with the parking lot owner. So I, I do think that it'd be easy to regulate those own, those parking lots that plan on having customers, you know, for their own purposes, as opposed to just some random lot where somebody feels like they could sneak on and park without anybody knowing about them. And, and maybe I'm totally wrong about that too, but it seems like, you know, that we, we could work on one that's easier to enforce while you're evaluating what the more subtle situations might end up being in the future. Well, that's a good distinction to con consider. And, and admittedly, most of the complaints that I've received were from um, lots where they were for hire. I mean, the, the, the people were paying to, to park and, and either the meter was broken and they got towed or, um, you know, um, as I said, a, sh a very short time. It was like almost a, the tow trucks like sitting there waiting, you know, for the, the meter to go click and then they go and 
uh, connect to the car and get going, you know. So uh, that's a good distinction to make and maybe something we research a little more and, uh, and, and think more about. Thank you. I think so, because the, the, the scenario I'm thinking about, Mr. Mayor, is a scenario where you have a private lot that you own. You post that it's for customers only. You don't charge anybody to park there, and then they go and park there, and they are not a customer. They're doing something completely different. They're going to another business. They're going to have a drink. Um, right. And there are plenty of examples of that. And what do we do in that scenario? Do we have to still call away for PEO or police officer to tow when someone is paying taxes on four or five lots downtown, spaces downtown to get people in and out of their business? The one lot that comes to mind is Jackson Davenport. You know, they've got what, four or five spaces there along the right side. They don't charge you to park there if you're a customer. And if you're a non-customer and you park there, you know, do we as a city sanction that and you know, make them then call the police to get somebody out of there? I think that's, I think we really need to think about the different scenarios. Right. Well, clearly that's a lot where most of the spaces are for hire. But not all of them though, right? But not all of them. I, yeah, yeah. Well, well, we'll put some thought into that. But um, anyway, um, I appreciate y'all's willingness to at least go to the next step because uh, the people that this happens to, maybe they're not that many of them, but boy, they, they in my opinion, rightfully get very upset. And it's, it's, a, um, it's a black eye on all of us. All right, any other comments, questions from the committee? I guess the directive here, Ms. Halverson, is to sort of think about those couple different scenarios and come back to us with a report and then maybe we'll get an ordinance going after that. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, great, thank you very much. Next, Mr. Somerville, Bike Share, Neutron Holding, DBA, Lime. Yes, um, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, bring the committee up to where we are with the current bike share program. Um, you know, I guess the process started back in August where we received, uh, we went out to bid and in September is when we received, um, uh, I guess, applications from six different companies. Um, and, you know, thanks to Gary Cooper and his uh, staff, we were able to have presentations um, in October and November um, in which we have selected uh, Neutron Holding uh, DBA line as the, um, uh, to be our bike share um, vendor per se. Um, now the contract, the, the current contract ends in February. Um, I actually was on the phone today with line who was very excited about coming to Charleston. Um, they wanna uh, come in and make contact and uh, do a, a launch program with the city. Um, so we will, I don't know if Jason Kronsberg is still on the line, but I'm going to have them come to the next um, design review uh, committee meeting um, so they can do, discuss the program and how they want to launch and move forward from there. So um, again, the contract expires in February. They are already um, looking at garage locations, looking at space in the city um, to where they can, um, again, kick off their launch and Again, very excited about coming to the city. So uh, we should be moving forward again in February um, with the new bike share program. Is there any questions? Any questions for Mr. Somerville on the transition to Lyme on the bike share program in the city? Council member Brady. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was just curious, I know, um, are they gonna retain uh, any of the branding from the previous vendor uh, for that, or is it going to be kind of the like lime green that people know from like the scooters and that type of thing? <laughs> That's uh, an excellent question and has been the subject of some conversations with lime. Um, and they've actually given us a prototype draft prototype that incorporates um, the colors that we currently have the, the, the light blue, but it will have a distinct lime streak on it just so it um, helps them with their branding too and I think Robbie I think we can share that with the committee it's no problem I know the mayor's seen it I've seen it it looks pretty good actually so um, they were sensitive to that when we talked to them after the presentations it's pretty cool any other questions from any member of the committee okay uh, anything else Mr. Somerville on bike chair no sir 
Right. Well, bike share has been popular in the city of Charleston. It's um, going to be an interesting transition, but the company that's taking over is well experienced and I think is excited about being in Charleston. So we should have an excellent experience with them. So thank you for your hard work, Mr. Somerville, on all that. Next, um, if necessary, do we need a motion to go into an executive session? Is someone out there to give us some advice on that, on the um, pedicab token process? Ms. Copeland, are you there? I am here. Hello there. Hi. <laughs> I mean, we, we can certainly go into executive session if anybody has any questions about legally where we need to go next with this process. I think that's probably a good idea. So we're all on the same page. Can I entertain a motion to go in executive session? Uh, this I'll may be the to... first in the history of my chairmanship of TNT that they're doing this. So we're going to do it briefly. We'll be right back. Okay, we got a motion from Council Member Jackson. I move that we uh, uh, go into executive session to determine yes. the next steps for this um, pedicab token process. Great. And we have a second from Council Member Brady. Um, yes, ma'am. Just want to make sure we bring Sterling Halverson and Gary Cooper into this executive session with us. Okay. And, Julia, is. and Julia and me as well. Ah, yes. And Rick Giroux. Sorry, I didn't see you down there. All right. Well, before we do that, all in favor of going into executive session? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Um, with that, who is in charge of putting us into a <sighs> breakout room? Uh, you all should be receiving the invite shortly. Thank, Thank you. you Except for you, Robbie. <laughs> 